Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, where we talk about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friend. And with me is the crappy hippie. On the show that's always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. Crappy hippie, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to check catch up. Real long time. It has been forever, man. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk later in the show about where I've been and why the show was put to sleep for a few months or multiple months. That's really important. But I think I think more importantly is we're here, and I think we want people to to know that we're back and we're not going anywhere, which is great news. We are here. We are. I am here. <laughs> we are here. So, but I thought maybe uh, so, so. Today on the show, we're gonna do fish in the news. And then we're going to catch up. Where have the fish nerds been? Why have we been off the air? We're going to catch up with Glasswater Lures and find out what's happening with John the Crappie Hippie's company. Talk about the fish nerds guide service. What have we been doing? And then some other fun bits in between with that. That's okay with you, John. Hey, it's okay. But when do we talk about catch up? Catch up? <laughs> we, got the, we got the tomato segment in the middle somewhere. So stay. So we got to catch up. We got to catch up. Hungry. But I, I thought more importantly, why don't we lead off with Fish in the News, which is actually our most popular segment, and that will get people in the mood to get back into the podcast. And here's the trick, John. My mixing board has multiple colored buttons to push. I don't know which one is Fish in the News anymore because it's been so long. So <laughs> you may end up hearing the wrong music. Let's try this one. Oh, I nailed it. All right, John, you brought us a story about, I think, a pickerel story or a musky story. A musky story. Musky, the fish of 10,000 casts, explained. Essox, Masquinongi. Am I saying that right? No. Call Doc, call James, <laughs> call Josh, call Amy, call somebody. Am I saying this right? There's no chance that's right, but I like how you said it, so I'm going to go with it. Okay. Yeah. Mas- Masquinongi. Just read the story, John. <laughs> Too bad we're done having kids because that would, okay, be a great name. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. In a new study, University of Illinois researchers got into the minds of muskies to learn what personality traits make the fish more likely to strike. In the process, they learned valuable lessons that could help conserve these important aquatic predators. John, can I stop you for a second? Sure. So let's talk about personality traits. Are they talking about the personality trait of the angler or the fish? Uh, the fish. Okay, the fish. okay, go on. Then. He's, <laughs> a, he's a freshwater ecologist, bro. All right, they're, well, they're, I mean, you know, I mean, there are some ecologists. The fish are the people. There are some ecologists <laughs> who would say that fish don't have personalities because they're fish. So I'm just, well, you know. These are the ones that have screwed up and become anglers, too. So they, <laughs> they, 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 they get personal. They do they get, get personal. personal. <laughs> Keep yeah. going. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see. Our results clearly show capturing muskies is not random. There are behavioral traits that predispose these fish to capture, says Corey Susky, professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois and the co-author of the study. Susky and graduate student John Bieber, I, I think that's Justin Bieber's kid or something. I don't know. Maybe his dad. I don't know. Something like that. But they evaluated behavioral traits mm-hmm. of activity, aggression, boldness, and exploration for 68 young muskies in laboratory tanks before transferring the fish to an outdoor pond. Then they fished the pond every day for more than a month. After 35 days of throwing our whole arsenal at them, every combination of day, lure, time, casting style, we only caught seven fish. That's that's, that's, addition, that's, that's normal musky fishing. That is normal musky I would say fishing. that's actually really good musky fishing. Decent. I mean, I guess that's a 10% success rate thereabouts. Yeah. So, yeah, not too bad, I guess. Um, in addition, we saw that catch rates declined very, very rapidly after the first several days, Bieber says. It was a long month. Now, this is the crazy part, Clay. This is the crazy part. This is the part I love. It's the reason I want to do this story. It turns out these captured fish were the larger, less exploratory, and less aggressive fish than their peers in the laboratory behavior tests. Bieber says that pattern lines up with muskie's overall feeding strategy. They're very tough. 
sit and wait predators, which means they'll just camp out under a log or at the bottom of a river until something comes right by, he says. Then they burst out and take the prey. More exploratory muskies won't strike because the reason they're roaming around, they're cruising the lake trying to find a new shelter or find trying to find a water column that's more comfortable. So while us anglers may be glad to learn, it's not our fault that muskies are so hard to catch. <laughs> the research has deeper implications. Since fish behavior can be passed from parent to offspring, anglers have a vested interest in keeping large, less exploratory, and less aggressive fish in the population. Those traits make muskies more likely to go after lures. So catch and release is key, says Susky. And then there are best practices, like landing fish quickly and releasing them in a way that minimizes impact on the fish, keeping an eye on the water temperature, and so forth like that. I mean, the researchers do know, excuse me, all. The, research, the researchers do note that most anglers in the muskie community are don't, you know, they don't harvest them these days, but angling can be inherently stressful. We all know that we talk about it on the show all the time and can lead to incidental mortality. So if enough of that happens and individuals vulnerable to capture are removed from the population, other behaviors, the ones not compatible with capture will become dominant among the muskies left behind. According to researchers, the current behavior observations are just one component of muskie capture rates. Why are muskies the fish at 10,000 casts? Well, they're sedentary and they hide, so you have to cast where there are. And we have anecdotal evidence that these fish, I'm sorry, Doc, you, you can call <laughs> these guys anecdotal evidence. I don't know. I it's don't something. Know. It's, it's observational. It's real. It I, happens. You know, but yeah, but I, 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 can see, uh, I can see Doc Martin's pot start to boil here. Mm -hmm. Um and we have anecdotal evidence that these fish seem to learn when anglers are around and actively avoid lures. And then, of course, there is the historical context. Years ago, people would harvest muskies, and they were taking the big, vulnerable fish out of the population. And so now we just have hard-to-catch fish left today. So there are a bunch of things that potentially contribute, Susky says. Um, I'm going to tell you right here, the title of their study sums it up best. The title is this. Muskie capture is predicted by behavior and size not metabolism so, so not by how hungry the fish is but by how it right, behaves right right capture is predicted by behavior and size not metabolism in muscalonge essox masquinongi it's fun to say and it's published in the north american journal of fisheries management and the authors are john bieber the grad student uh michael lewison who apparently just emptied the net because he, he he's not in any part of this article and, <laughs> and, and and Corey susky and the research was supported by the illinois department of natural resources the u.s fish and wildlife service and the usda institute of food and agriculture so thanks for that great funding from those sources and I'm sure thanks for this great report I, I, I think I want to go fishing with this susky guy i, I really you know do. if you look if your name rhymes with the fish you're fishing for your odds <laughs> of success are better. So absolutely, Sus absolutely. Susky, the musky guy or girl. I, I don't even I forgot the name, but yeah, Corey. I don't know. Yeah, you can't know. tell always. But uh, anyway, Susky, the musky hunter, is the perfect name for a musky fisher. John, I've I've never fished for muskies. Never, huh? No. In fact, we don't have muskies in New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont, for that matter. We have in New Hampshire. The closest we have would be the uh, pike, northern pike. And so I have caught northern pike. But uh, incidentally, I do own a muskie. I own a uh, five, four foot, four and a half foot length uh, mounted muskie that I got for, I did a speaking engagement for New Hampshire Audubon. I went down and talked about New Hampshire fishes. And as a present for thanking me to speak, for speaking for them, instead of paying me, because no one ever wants to give me money, uh, they gave me a stuffed muskie. And that muskie lives in my wife's kindergarten classroom hanging on the wall. It's got these giant teeth. It's a really vicious looking fish. Oh man, that is too cool. It is, is cool. Just, it's I a love good, that it's whole a, story. It's a good I gift. Um, yeah, but, I, well. but, I, but I have been fishing for, uh, for, for Northern Pike and it, it's infuriating. And just like the musky fishing where you can see the fish in the water and you can cast your lure in front of them a hundred times and they don't care one bit. They don't oh, even, yeah. they uh, don't even react. They just hey, I, they sit there. I, I I can back that up with my own anecdotal evidence. Of course, I haven't gotten into any really uh, world-class pike fishing since I was up in Canada as a kid, but there was a day where they were just, 
it was a post cold front type thing. And I mean, I literally dropped the spinnerbait straight down on the musky and hit him on the head. And he mm -hmm. just, he just backed up a little bit. I mean, there was nothing you could put a little, little crappy jig in front of me. And you know, they, yeah, I know they can do it. I, you know, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever get hardcore about fishing for muskies. It, it sounds interesting. Um, I mean, those musky folks, they're a breed apart, you know, um, you know, and musky angling has that sense of old school romance. I just love it, but they're a specialist type. They're a specialist type of fishing. They're very dedicated. They're very single-minded. They're willing to go all day for only a strike or two. I mean, you know, total specialists. I know. And that's why I'm like, always like, give me the, like the, I want the fish that are the, the sluts of the ocean or the sluts of the, of the bay. I want the, the fish that will eat anything. Cause I am all about easy fishing <laughs> so that's that's always my angle i go for john i'm just like because easy to catch i'm in and in fact this is this is true like i go fishing with my, my partner Vinny and i go fishing a lot together and he'll be fishing for like we'll talk about lake trout but he'll be hunting lake trout and and he's you know he'll fish four hours for one fish and i'll be sitting in the shallows catching perch after perch after perch having way more fun than i think he's having but he's actually in his brain having way more fun than I'm having. So it's really personality of the angler with, with these fish. So musky anglers, their own kind of person, that's for sure. Well, you know, I know Vinny and I've, you know, read about his uh, exploits on the Laker with uh, Instagram and so forth. And yeah, he's, he fits this, this description exactly. You know, there, it would be upsetting to him to fiddle with little old perch when mm -hmm. on his mind is on unlocking the key to those deep water Lakers oh, if, and vice if, versa. If we had muskies here, Vinny would be all over him. That's, oh yeah, that's all he'd yeah. be doing, and he'd be oh yeah, and he'd be obsessive with it and obnoxious. So well, he's <laughs> like, you know, his his uh, crusade to prove that uh, bass are an ice fisher's fish at the right time of year, stuff like that. Oh. When he gets an idea, he bears down on it until he gets it gets it figured out. You'll you'll love this. Vinny caught a six pound bass today through the ice, fishing with four pound test. And a one quarter ounce tungsten jig with a piece of worm on it. So that, that sounds real. I, you know, that's real last fishing. Last time I got to go ice fishing was 2020, and I got a four and change on mm -hmm. two pound test. Yes, it's a fun, little, isn't it? little spoon that Tim had sent me with a maggot on it. So, yes, yes, indeed. People, well, you've said it on this show a lot of times. There ain't no such thing as a fish that can't be caught through the ice. And it's true. I think that's true. <laughs> well, I've always heard, you know, oh, don't waste your time. And now it's a big, big deal to go out and fish. You know, bass fishers will not be, you know, dissuaded. They will try to catch them no matter what. And yeah. so they're excited to know that, you know, maybe the old school says no bass in the wintertime, but the new school is like, pick up your rod and fish, please. All right. So, John, you know, the thing about musky fishing is the lures are insane. You, you fish for musky at all? I don't fish for musky and uh just because you know Kansas we're kind of fish species poor we're more of a catfish crappie bass type place I love catfish um but... yeah no I, I I've never got it now I'm fascinated with it and uh especially the lures I I love musky baits well, let's let's talk about some musky baits because you you've you because you're a lure expert so you should be the one leading this combo <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so yet. when you think mus musky bait, what's 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 the one overall overriding thing about musky bait? It should look like a Chevy Block engine and Lady Gaga, like if they had a love child. That would be what a musky bait is. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, they got to be big, right? They big gotta be, and you know, hairy. Some are made for reaction. Yep, yep. Big and hairy. Yep. Reaction strike or whatever. So right. anyway, uh, you know, a lot of things. Man, my brain's just hopping and popping right now. Okay, I mean the musky killer series from meps is one that just bam hits me right on top of the head you know the, the the giant killer i think is 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 the shallow water one and the musky killer is the deep water one anyway they've got all kinds uh because they were getting this back in 1961 they were uh getting a lot of information that people were catching muskies on the smaller maps and so they were like hey let's let's get it up there and and compete so that's one that jumps to mind right away. And then the other one that just, you know, I just love, uh, Tim did a great piece on the Lure Love podcast about the Suic Thriller. And it seems to make every list, um, you know, uh, magazine, what have you, as to what is a good muscular. So, you know, a big, long, uh, old school 
uh, semi divers. Uh, you can bend it to make it dive. You can make a walk on the surface. You can just do a lot of things with it. And it was popular then. And it's still popular now. Of course you get your big spoons, you know, your red eye, your Eppinger daredevil. I mean, Eppinger daredevil, big old Eppinger daredevil and red and white. You know, you can't really do better than that. Every musky person out there has that. And then, of course, there's a plethora of duck imitations, large and small, oh. muskrat imitations, John, mouse imitations. John, hang on a second. Frogs. I got to stop you. I got to stop you. So I knew a pike fisherman. <laughs> I knew this was coming. And I, I told this story <laughs> on the podcast years ago, but I want to tell it again for new listeners. This is in <laughs> Rattleboro, Vermont. And, you know, you, you can, our friend Luke Chamos, Chamos Lures, Luke Chamos, makes duckling lures. They look like ducklings and they flop on, they flop around on top of the weeds. So uh -huh. I met a guy at Sam's Sporting Goods. I'm very, very specific. I'm calling him out by name, a real sporting goods shop, <laughs> who was telling me how he pike fishes. And he raises ducklings just for pike bait. And I can't think of anything more horrible. But I'll give you the, I'll, <laughs> in, in all, I'm going to tell you the technique so you know if, you, if you're going to do this. And you should not do this. This is a terrible idea. But here is the, here's what you do. You take your duckling, and it's really important. It'd be the cutest duckling you've ever seen. It, it must the cuter it, the better. It, you know, if you don't cry when you look at this duckling, then it's the wrong duckling for the job. <laughs> <laughs> you get the biggest treble hook you can find, and put it on the duck's back. Don't poke it into the duck because that's mean. And we're going to be mean to the duck, but not yet. <laughs> so, and then take a rubber band and secure the hook to the back of the duck with a rubber band. And of course, that hook is tied to your fishing line. Take the duckling, put it on the, the weeds. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you this is a bad idea. Do not do this. And if you do do it, you heard it from Sam's Sporting Goods, not from me. So you put it on the weeds and you open your bail and let the duck run. And that, I'm told, is the best pike and musky bait there is. And it's awful. It's like fishing with puppies, John. It's a terrible idea. It's it's absolutely. And horrible, you laughed at it, John, and that makes you a bad person. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I you know I, I I can't help it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a I don't know one of those Three Stooges things. It's a nervous it. laughter. It's a laughter because yeah, you don't yeah, know I mean, what else. It's awful. It's terrible. Don't no, do it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking to a guy that I I mean I I'm pretty much giving up bait fishing everything except minnows and and worms and I I'm even you know having doubts about the minnows sometimes. But I I feel you on that one. I, like John, I raised turkeys this year for food, and my turkeys I've been pardoned. They're just hanging around e eating food. They're useless, but I have them still. So I'm, I'm oh man, you. yeah, they're not even cute. Oh, okay, they're not even cute. They're awful. I, no, they're not even they're cute. Terrible and, animals. Uh, they're stupid. Hey, I I. <laughs> I thought the strategy there was to name them after food. I, I thought we like did. when the first time you did this, Sammy named one roast beef and then it was okay to eat. We, we did that. But then this year we had a few turkeys commit suicide and then <laughs> one got eaten by a predator. And then I felt bad for the leftovers. So I couldn't. <laughs> the survivors. Okay, sur yeah. Leftover. We're talking food. So, <laughs> so well, that, anyway. that is, that is, but anyway, we're not Re talking refocus about, about back to muskies. Yeah. 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 We, we're going to talk about live bait, but, but you know, so there's some examples, and I've got a few more here, but I, what I want to move on to is talking about friend of the pod, John Girock, and these musky flies he talks about, oh, because yes. he's another one of these people. Now, now, Big John's just as happy to fish for bluegill as he is to fish for musky or anything else, but, but you know, so he's kind of the best of both worlds. He, he likes a lot of dings over here on this side, but he'll go for those steelhead, those Atlantic salmon, those kind of fish where, oh, you may only get one strike, you know, all week. So not getting a strike over the space of a day doesn't really shake him up. But Although, he, he uh, when, I, when I talked to John Girak, like when I talked to him a couple of times, he made it clear that his preference is to catch fish. So he does get a little bit like, you know, it is nice to fish, but he really does want to catch them. He's just like the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think, you know, when you read his books, um, he, he gets he, he went to Scotland one time and, and, and didn't fiction. get a strike all week. <laughs> He still had a he still had a good time. Yeah. yeah, and he uh he he is addicted. He he tries to make uh, a trip up to Wisconsin, you know, every season to uh, get into some musky fishing on the fly rod. And yeah. and, and there's a couple of great essays about his evolution. But anyway, he talks about the flies that start out. Some of them are smallish, you know, three or four inches, mm -hmm. up to like over a foot long. And and these guides have these fly quote unquote boxes that are more like he says more like briefcases or sample cases with, with display pages. And I, you know, some of these, you can't, you know, the idea of a guy making a bunch of false casts and all that, you better get that out of your mind because when you're fishing with a foot long, 
purple and orange articulated what's it you're going to do a waterhall cast because that's all you can do with that thing so mm-hmm. it's really interesting all these lures but i'm telling you crazy and big yeah you got it that's at the core of most of them yeah but but interestingly john is is just like any esox you can catch big fish on tiny lures and i always recommend people scale down the lures if fish aren't biting so i, I think it'll be fun to see you know if anyone listeners are ca- catching musky on small lures i'd love to see what they're catching them on because like when i when, when i'm not catching fish like even today I, we were ice fishing and we clients weren't catching fish so we scaled their hooks down and they started catching huge pickerel on tiny jigs they went from big hey. spoons nothing would eat them to tiny jigs and pickerel slam them boom 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 so i think when you're not catching fish change what you're doing maybe that fish habits will change too with it Hey, spoken from the wisdom of the wise. I mean, you know, it's uh, you've been out there doing it, and I've I've been there. I mean, at a time, you know, I've seen that. You know, you go, you can even change from what you think is small, mm-hmm. like a one thirty second ounce jig, down to a sixty fourth or an eightieth, and all of a sudden you're just you know hauling them in one after the another. So yeah, sure, and uh, you know, people say, well, yeah, sometimes a year muskie want those smaller baits because that's what they're used to seeing. That's kind of what they're chasing, and then. But that doesn't explain the purple and pink, you know, shocker that I think is just out there to make them mad. Um, well, but yeah, I, I agree. That's any anybody that's fished a while is going to tell you downsize before you upsize. Of course, you talk you you talk about Luke. Now he he likes to he likes to just keep keep getting bigger till he gets so big he's only going to catch the big one. You well, know, and it, that's and that's true. Like if you use giant lures, you're only going to catch giant fish. But the giant fish, you're not going to catch very many of them. And some people are super happy with that and that their style of fishing. If they're happy, I'm, I'm happy for them. I so, hear you. Yeah. All right, John, we got to wrap this news up. So I'm going to, I'm not going to, I had another story, but I'm not going to do it because we ran over time on that one. So I'll save that for next time. But I do have a story about the, a guy who, who, uh, who vandalized the Goonies house, stole a yacht, got rescued by the Coast Guard, got brought back to shore. And then walked away from the hospital, and then turns out he was wanted by Canadian police. That's the whole story, actually. That's there's no more story than that. That's the whole story. <laughs> 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 I was gonna I was gonna read the story, then just summarize the whole thing. I was gonna save it for next time, but that actually is the entire story. But John, I don't know if you saw the video of this or not. I'm, I'm actually gonna no, do that. I'm, I'm forget. I'm doing the story now. I'm gonna do it. So so this dude was out in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Oregon. And the Coast Guard had come rescue him. And uh, I saw this morning, my dad sent me, my dad's in the Coast Guard, and my dad sent me a link of the video of this rescue. And he's on this big yacht. And the helicopter comes and drops swimmers in the water next to the yacht. One gets on the yacht. This huge wave comes over, rolls the yacht over twice. And then they rescue both the swimmers and the dude on the yacht. They bring the yacht, guy in the yacht back to shore into a hospital, get him checked out, and set him free. And turns out he's wanted by the Canadian police, and he just got done vandalizing the house from the Goonies movie. And it just happened this weekend. Breaking news, John. Breaking news. <laughs> well, you know, what, what do they know? They figured, you know, just another rich dum-dum with his new yacht. Yeah. didn't know how to, how to do it. So, yeah. you know, they ain't got, they ain't got any uh, probable cause. But, wow, that's a little frustrating for the people that were chasing him, that's for sure. Yeah, well, and, and here's what I think. I think the whole thing's fake. It's oh, all, right. even though I saw the video and I saw the news releases and I saw all this stuff because they just started filming Goonies 2. So I uh, think the whole thing is just to get the word Goonies into the news cycle and to make the Fish Nerds podcast say the word Goonies like seven times in a row. Yeah, they got us. They got us. They, We've gotten sucked into a publicity stunt here, they, Clay. They've nailed it, John. And uh, I'll take my Goonies sponsorship check tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm gonna end the news right there wrong button i'm gonna end the news right there. all right that was fish in the news thanks john for doing that with me i appreciate you all the efforts on that one I do want to um, start doing product reviews on the Fish Nerds podcast. I get every so often people send me stuff to, t- to, t- to test out or taste. Um, I owe a review to Wyoming Whiskey, who sent me some whiskey over Christmas, and I, I drank it, and I liked it, and I want to talk about it more, but I'll do that in a future episode. I've got dehydrated foods I want to eat. 
Um, but sometimes I'll buy things and want to test them. And today, John, I went to Walmart and bought the this tiny spin casting rod. It was it's the tiniest, teeniest rod I've ever seen. It it's actually the size of a lighter I have for lighting my wood stove. I don't know oh man, I don't, okay. I, I don't okay. know if you've seen a picture of it or not. No, you sent me a picture of it, and I'm like, what is that out of a James Bond movie? I mean, and then I had you know you. Then you put a pickerel down, you know, to compare the size. But since I didn't know how big the pickerel was, it is, uh, you know, I don't exactly. <laughs> it makes the rod make... look huge. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So uh, tell me about it because I, I was very, very interested. All right. We're going to talk about it. It's actually from a company called Proficiency. It's Proficient, F-I-S-H-I-E-N-C-Y. And they make this little spin casting, yeah, tiny but mighty spin cast pocket combo. combo. It's the cutest little fishing rod. I ever had it. It has a Zebco like push button style spin casting rod on it, uh, reel on it, and it's only about twelve inches long when it's all collapsed, and it raises out to about eighteen inches. And the line is three pound test. It goes from the spool, and it goes through the rod blank. You have to thread it through there, and then out to your fishing lure. And we took it on the ice day, and we tested it out, and and it is. <laughs> so John, this thing is the cutest little fishing rod. I saw it at Walmart and couldn't help myself. Now, incidentally, at Walmart it's nineteen ninety nine. If you buy it from Proficiency dot com, it's twenty four ninety nine plus shipping. So, you know, I guess you're better off going to Walmart. But it's a it literally is. Well, they're not. Most companies try not to under. Uh, it's literally the cutest little fishing rod I've ever seen, and I had no choice but to buy it. So I bought it. We brought it out to uh, the pond today. And I put a little micro jig on it, uh, like a little, um, little, little, little wrap, shad wrap type jig on it. We jigged it under the ice for a long time, caught no fish. And then Vinny's kid, Grady, took it from me and put on a tungsten jig with a piece of worm and caught fish after fish after fish after fish, including some pretty big pickerel that were pushing 18 inches on this thing. And the drag run out and spun out and did all well, the things. And it was so, so fun. He had a blast with it, and he almost kept it. Why isn't Grady here? Why are you telling me about this? Because Grady, Grady's going to call the fish. Because you know, Grady's 14 and horrible to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. I can dig it. I can yeah. dig it. Say no more. Yeah, but yeah. so I didn't catch, right, I didn't right. catch, well, listen, any, I, saw, I didn't catch any fish on this thing. Uh, but, but, uh, he, he did and he loved it. Well, I'm glad that's cool because you always wonder about, you know, those little tiny reels can be kind of uh, a scream sometimes. And, mm -hmm. I, I like the way the, the line runs through the, the center of the blank like a sabiki rod, like a lot of the sabiki rods mm -hmm. you see. Uh, that's kind of a crazy way to, to do things. And then I noticed it has a little, uh, kind of a little eyelet on it. Is that for hanging it up or is that for fishing or what, well, what, so what's that on there? So there's a little eyelet on, if you if you follow the rod blank up from the reel before you get to the, actually where the string goes through, there's, there's a little stopper in there that you unscrew that. Inside there are these two little weights. And they're like weights like the size of sewing needles. And what you do is you take the line, if you want to string the line up, you take the line from the spool, tie it to those weights, and then drop it into the rod blank and shake it down through, and it pops up the other side. That's, your, that's how you thread it. And so they have genius, this. Genius, genius, genius. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really clever little thing. Um, now, here I'll, I'll give you the, the, the pros. Are, it works. It's fun. It's super cute. It's only 20 bucks. Fits in your glove box. You could take it anywhere, and I will. I'm going to travel with this thing and have some fun. I'll give you the cons here. Uh, like 100% of pre-strung combos, rod and reel combos, what's wrong with the with the string on those, John? Do you remember? It's, uh, it's crap? Yeah, it comes with line memory. It comes already springy and weird Of and course, crappy. it's been on there you know, for a year or two. <laughs> right, who knows yeah. how long it's been on there. So that's yeah. number oh my one. God. <laughs> number two, it's three-pound test. Which means old people like me can't see it. Right, right, right. <laughs> so if it had some color to it, maybe I could do it, like if it was orange or green or something. But <laughs> I, it took me forever just to string it up because I had to tie this little sewing needle lead weight on it. To, oh, that was a lead or not, but it would tie the weight onto it with, this, with it. it. It was impossible. I got it done, but it took me a long time. Then tying hooks on it took me a long time also because it's a three-pound test. And three-pound test is also the other drawback because – most fish that you catch will break off a three-pound test line in seconds, even with your drag set loose. It's just really hard to land a fish on three-pound test line. But we did today. We we managed to get it done. So if I was to if I was making Respect. this rod, 
I would put a maybe braided line on there or something a little bit better quality than, than that three pound test they have line on there. But other than that, it's fun, super cute. My kids I looked at it and went, Dad, I want one too. I'm like, you and like Zoe fishes, but Blue Jay doesn't fish. And, and I'm like, you don't even fish. He goes, yeah, but it's so cute, Dad. I want to have that thing. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> it's cute factor. <laughs> yeah. But I'm in on this thing. Oh, and I, yeah. And I, I cute can't. Factor. And I agree. You know, I yeah. agree. Uh, I just, I'd, I'd load it up with the braid. Uh, load it up with the braid. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I'm, I'm digging the braid idea without a doubt. Yeah. I, uh, I've got the uh, three pound diameter braid with a 10 pound test strength on one of my ultralights. And, you know, like I hooked a five on a little jig this summer. And boy, that was a quite a relief. Mm -hmm. Um, because my drag was really sticky and I was like, Oh man, if this had been actual three pound, I'd be out of luck. But, yeah. but, uh, the braid has no memory and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so funny because you talk about that line coming off there like a slinky, you know, and then you tie on one of your 30, uh, 64 ounce jigs and won't even pull the line out straight. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yeah, it's crazy. But anyway, that's my review for that one. It's a cool product, but you know, it's, it's gimmicky and fun. I see if you want it, if you got 20 bucks worth throw away, go for it. All right, John, we're going to wrap this show up. But first, got to talk about where we've been. I think we need to get to that. And, and all I'll, right, I'll all let right. you go first because you run glass water angling. And I do run glass water angling. How is that business going? It, it's going good. Now, um, as, as you know, uh, I ran off with Tim, and, and we spun off the podcast. But mm -hmm. then that uh, project came to a conclusion. Um, so I'm, that's one place I've been. But, yeah, as far as uh, glass water goes, I'm just still – chipping away plodding along having a good time meeting a lot of great people um i've, I've been doing some uh, fun orders for some uh, public service groups like uh i do the hack and sack children's fishing contest they order bugs because they want lead free bugs uh, i got the main auto bond society using us uh, as one of the uh, companies in their tackle exchanges uh, so that's that's a nice account um, but by and large, it's just folks that either watch the tube channel or listen to the podcasts or, uh, just, you know, find out about me, um, this way or that, but mainly it's just a matter of, gosh, we're up to, if you count all the variables and all that stuff, we're up to like 14, 1500 products now. So that's a lot it of stuff. keeps me hopping, keeps me hopping. Well, that's good. That's good. And I probably should let people know what happened to the fish nerds podcast and why we kind of faded out in November. So we were gearing up for National Podcast Posting Month. We were trying to like, national, that's where you do a podcast every single day. This year's theme was going to be how fishing ruined my life. I had like, I had like 20 stories I wanted to tell about how fishing could have ruined my life. And then on like day four of the podcast, my, my, my computer died on me. My computer that had everything on it, all my audio sound effects, all our files, everything. It just fried off on me. And and I got really mad at it, and I brought it to the computer repair shop, who then sat on it for three weeks. So there's the three weeks of November left. I couldn't do any work because they had the computer the whole time. And I went in there after three weeks to pick it up, and I go to the dude. I go, okay, so what's going on with my computer? He goes, oh, I haven't even looked at it yet. I'm like, you've had it for three weeks. Like, I'm trying to run a podcast. I need my computer. I, my my tens of listeners care about this thing. <laughs> and, and uh, he goes, okay, hey, well, I, you know, I'll call you later. I, I leave the room, and uh, 20 minutes later, I get a phone call. Hey, I had a chance to look at your computer, and uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, great. What do you want me to do about it? He goes, well, come on in. And, the, and he goes, I'll show you why it doesn't work. And he fires it up. And he goes, oh, it's working now. It's fired right back up. It turned on. Oh, but your files are not accessible. Your, your drive is fried. So I couldn't access anything. And then he goes, do you want me to – recover your files that would only cost you 80 bucks i'm like 80 bucks recover files i i, I have a, a little device that can do that that cost 25 that i bought on amazon so i said no thank you and he gave the computer back and he charged me 350 dollars for holding my computer for hostage for three weeks and not doing any work on it so right. that frustrated me to no end and i didn't have any money because i shut down my fishing business my 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 uh guide service in September because I was going to be in a play. I was in Young Frankenstein, the musical. I played the monster. And so I didn't make any money for months and months and months. And so I had to buy a new laptop. And so I had to go to Walmart and buy the cheapest Walmart laptop available for $199. And it's clunky. It doesn't work well. We're using it right now, by the way. 
Um, so maybe it's working fine. We'll see. <laughs> Let's but, hope. But I wasn't motivated. I kind of lost some mojo to it. And, uh, but I've been, it seemed like it's been kind of haunting me to kind of get this going back up again. And then, uh, John has been texting me saying, come on, Clay, let's go. Come right there, right there. That's, um, that's my impression of John King. <laughs> that's good. That's good. It's yeah. not bad. And, uh, and so, uh, and then, and I put out a call looking for a new co host and a new, um, correspondent. I got a lot of responses. We'll be reaching out to you for doing some bitch with us soon. Uh, but John has been hassling me, and he's right. He said, let's get things fired up. And here we are making a new podcast for you. So we are on it. And I'm back on the ice ice fishing again, too, with my clients. So I'm back in business there as well. So we're we're back on our feet, John. Hey, I'll give that a big hell yes. Hell yes. So that's the whole story. You got any questions about it, John? Are you filling any blanks in? Uh, no. I, I All I can say is all I can do is commiserate about computers blowing up. And sometimes, I mean, I was trying trying to do work on a little vacay, uh, staying with some friends up in Massachusetts. And uh, I was working on an interview, very tedious. This is back before I knew how to really control an interview, the questions. You know, I used to just turn in these big haystacks that had to be edited, edited down for hours. Anyway, my computer blew up. So I just said, you know what? That's the fish angels helping me out. Mm-hmm. I can't work now. I got to go fishing, you know, I got to go fishing, but, but yeah, I love the guy charging you a hundred dollars a week storage fee. And then then another 50 just to turn it on and say, it's broke. (laughs) Ain't no working thing. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Yeah, but everyone likes him but me. So, because he has a great <laughs> reputation in town. I'm like, what are you talking about? He stole my money from me. <laughs> but so, John, this year, the ice fishing, I run an ice fishing charter service, and we have been on the ice now with clients for only a week. And usually by now, we've run maybe 12 or 13 charters, and we've run three charters. And wow. So, so, uh, just the ice not getting safe? Well, uh, well, we're actually on about 15 inches of ice now. But two weeks ago, we were on about five inches of ice. And three weeks ago, we had almost no ice. So the ice came in real slow. We had a real warm winter. Luckily, this past couple of days, we've had sub-zero temperatures. We were at like minus 19 yesterday morning, uh, which is a great temperature for making new ice. <laughs> Bad hey. temperature for fishing, but good temperature for building ice. You gotta know this man is an ice fishing guide when he says thank goodness it got down to minus 19 we finally had a good a good night i was so happy i was so happy (laughs) but today was 35 degrees and i took a a group of uh folks who um from uh, boston and they all they all speak uh is taiwanese rest they're from taiwan what language they speak taiwanese is that the right Uh, probably well there's what a half a dozen dialects of chinese i don't know I don't know what the predominant one can Cantonese or yeah, I don't know. But anyway, what it is in Taiwan. Anyway, they kept a bucket load of pickerel and perch, and they just texted me some beautiful pictures of how they cooked it. And they steamed it and made soup and all kinds of great looking food. So I was pretty happy to get those guys on the ice and girls. Well, can you get back to them and get us some recipes? Because this show is ostensibly about fish fishing and eating fish. Mm-hmm. We gotta pump up that eating we don't do nearly enough of that john so we'll bring that back and and i can't think up tons and tons of recipes but people that send cool fish food pictures we're gonna have to get back with those folks we'll have to get back to it if you're a fishing person and and you're interested in a cooking person a fish cooking person you want to get on the podcast we can use a fishing correspondent so just reach out to me let me know if you want to do that john we gotta wrap the show up i'm out of time here buddy sounds all right to me man all right thanks for having me back do you remember the uh the exit phrasing here oh i think i can all right pull that out of this uh rapidly enfeebling brain of mine it is not, yeah, it is it not scripted but first of all john i want to thank you for coming on the show and hassling me uh to get this going uh big thanks to uh our families for letting us podcast and tolerating our our silliness while we're doing this and uh until next time john follow the code of the fish nerds spawn early and often never take a free lunch with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. I think I come backwards. I'm not sure that was even right. <laughs> but we got it done, I think. We got it done. We made a podcast. Whether you're Woo-hoo! Woo! Fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean, casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Fried in a basket or broiled in a pan. Raw like you're in Siam, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a
podcast. We did it, John. We're back in business, buddy. You got it, bro. All right, I'm going to let you go. I can see you're just beat like a drum. So oh, I'm falling apart. I've been out since three this morning. So. Yeah, yeah.